In the previous video, we looked at, I guess, the philosophy of writing software for GUIs. And I thought in this video, we'd actually talk about how the programs are internally structured. It doesn't matter what system you're using, whether it's a Mac, whether it's Windows, whether you're writing for a RISCOS, an Atari, an Amiga, X11, it, they all seem to have a, a similar structure. One of the things you find with GUI software is that one GUI program is very similar to the next GUI program or the previous one you wrote. And so it lends itself to having sort of libraries or frameworks, particularly object-oriented frameworks that you can use to write the software. So these days, you, if you go and write, say, software on a Mac, you'd perhaps use Coco to do it. And you wouldn't necessarily see this structure internally. Or if you write it in Java, you would use the Java frameworks to do it. Um, but under the hood, the same thing's there. And we're going to be looking at under the hood what's going on and how the operating system is getting the interaction from the user into the program so you can write what's happening. So when we talked in the previous year, one of the things we said is that with a GUI program, the program is no longer in control of how things happen to the program. They can't say at this point, I want you to enter this piece of text. It's very much up to the user that's driving it. The user's clicking on things, they're moving windows around, they're in control. And so you need to structure your program to respond to those events coming in from the user and then process them and do the right thing based on what that happens. And the way that most GUI programs are written is they have what's called an event loop at the center of them. And basically in that event loop, the computer will be sitting in a loop, because it's a loop, doing the same thing after again. And you basically get a call to an operating system supply function. And let's say it's called wait next event. That's what it was called on the original Mac. On the Atari ST, it was called event message or event multi, depending on what sort of site you wanted. On RISCOS, it's called WIMP poll. Windows does something slightly better, something slightly neater, some of them I would probably say, but it's the same sort of thing. We'll look at that in a second. Well, so what the operating system does, or what the toolbox that provides the user interface does, is it's sitting there, it's monitoring the input coming from the user, whether that's from the keyboard, whether that's from the mouse being moved or the mouse being clicked and so on. And it assembles those inputs into a series of events. So if I press a key on the keyboard, we will get two events for that. We'll get an event when the key goes down and we'll get an event when the key comes up as well. And those events go through the operating system as from the hardware, up through the operating system and into the user interface part of the operating system. And then they get passed to our program as events. So when I press a key on the keyboard, eventually wait next event will return saying, hey, there's a key down event from the user. And then I would have to write code here that says there's a, a key down event, do the right thing in that situation. And then a bit later on, you get the key up event when I let go of the key and you do the right thing there. In the same way, if I move the mouse or press a button, we'll get an event or a message telling us that the mouse has moved and that the mouse button has been clicked. And we'll get a mouse down event and a mouse up event as the button's pressed and comes back up. And that event will tell us what the button was, the location where it was pressed, and so on. In the same way, the keyboard event would tell us what key was pressed and what was happening. So our program is sitting there waiting for the next event. So what you'll generally end up with is this will often return some sort of structure with the data in. And then you'll have a big switch statement or a series of if statements to switch on the event type. And this is sort of pseudo code. And then we switch on the type. And if it's a key down event, we do one thing. If it's a key up event, we do another and so on. And then we can handle those things. These aren't the only events you get. The UI toolkit will create lots of other events that you can do to do things. So for example, if we've got Windows on our system. Is there a more generic term for these things than Windows? Just because Windows is Windows and... Uh, no, they are called Windows. I've not seen them referred to as anything else. If we click on the window bar to move it around the screen, then we don't get a mouse down event there and have to track the window being moved around and then getting a mouse up. What the operating system, what the UI toolkit will do is say, okay, you've clicked on the title bar, you've moved the window around, I'll send you an event once you've finished dragging it to say the window has been moved to this position. In the same way, if I have another window overlapping it like that, and I then move that one out the way, suddenly this part of the window here becomes revealed and I have to draw that part of the screen again or the operator has to make sure that, that part of the screen gets drawn again. And so we can end up with lots of events coming from Windows, but they're constructed by the UI toolkit based on what's happening. So we may have a case, for example, that the window has moved 
or we might have a case that the window needs to be redrawn. And so what happens is our program basically sits in this big loop and we do that while quit isn't true. So basically we have some sort of thing that says, okay, the program's finished so we can get out and we set that to be true and then we'll stop this loop. But we sit in this loop, continually going there, waiting for an event. If there's not an event, then this will just block. The system won't let us continue until there is an event there. On the other hand, if there's lots of events, we'll get them through one by one and we'll process them to update things based on what the user's done, based on what's happening. We've talked about the key down event, the key up, mouse click events. We probably wouldn't get one when the mouse is moved. If you think about it, as the mouse is being moved, you'll get lots and lots of events, most of which you're not interested in. You're probably only interested when a button's pressed or so on. The only times perhaps that's different is if perhaps you're dragging something around the screen. And in that case, you will often say to the operating system, well, I'm dragging something here. Tell me about those events. The rest of the time, you're not interested in what's happening at those points. So you probably don't get mouse move events, but you can register them. And you can also do clever things like say, actually tell me when it moves into this area or moves out of this area so that you don't get multiple ones, but you can sort of track what's going through at that time. So our program is based around a series of events coming in that represent the input coming from the user. But we still have a problem. We still have to sort of direct these things to the right place. I mean, it's obvious if we've got sort of a window moved event, we know that we're coming from that window and we know it's moved, so we know what it's being dealing with. Likewise, if we get a mouse click event, it's pretty obvious where it's going. We can find out exactly what window's underneath there, but for something like a key down event, it's a bit, bit more nebulous. Um, we have to have some sort of idea of there being a current window, um, which would then deal with it, but that may not be the right place for it to go. So for example, you may have a text box, but then someone presses, Control Q, which means quit the program. And so actually, if the text box dealt with that, then we well, want the text box quitting. Um, so it probably wouldn't do it. You want them to enter Control Q into the text box as data. So you need to have it pass back up to the rest of the program. You need to sort of work out where you want this event to be dealt with. And in some systems, you have to program that into the logic of your code. In others, you can sort of direct where you want things to go. So Windows actually made a nice optimization. They, instead of having the sort of way next event loop and then you did a test based on what was returned, you have a similar structure. So you still say while quit equals false. And then inside that you have your loop which says peak message. So you have a look to see if there's something in there and that returns the event. Windows calls it messages rather than events because you get a message from the operating system when the event happens, it, it makes sense of things. And then you run another function on it which translates it slightly. So you run the translate message function and then you run another function called dispatch message. And that becomes your main loop of a Windows program. And if you look in most Windows programs, they will have something like that there. It may be hidden inside the .NET frameworks, it may be hidden inside MFC, whatever you're using to write your program, but somewhere inside there, you're gonna get something like that. So how's Windows handling it? Well, the same thing's happening, but what Windows did, um, and this goes back way, is when you create a window in Windows, and I'm gonna use an Atari window as an example here, when you do it on a Mac or on Atari or on RISCOS, you just create a general window and you tell it what you want it to look like. With Windows, you actually associate a function with it. You associate a class with it, and that has a function that handles messages with it. And so what Windows can do is when a message comes in, it can direct it to the specific window because it knows what function to call. So your program actually doesn't have a big switch there and it has lots of functions which are then bound to the windows that you want them to handle. So that's basically how you write a GUI program. You have your event loop, your message handling loop at the center of things. And then as the user interacts with it, you have to handle the messages, the events that come in and update your program state. Now there's two things that immediately jump to be obvious here. You want this code that handles this thing to be quick because if it takes a long time to process that message, then it'll be a long time before the next message is processed. So if you press a key and it say takes four, 40 seconds to handle that key being pressed, it'll be 40 seconds before the next key would then appear on the screen. So you, you often found that you had to write your programs in a way that they do some processing and then go back into the event loop and then carry on and do a bit more processing and do a bit more of the event loop. So they still 
appeared to function. Otherwise, you'd often get that effect where the GUI froze while it did some processing and then came back to life, which was not fun to use as a program. So you had to basically have this happening all the time. The other thing you can do is push things off into another thread and have them running at the same time. But again, that creates its own interesting issues for writing software. But because we're dealing with windows on the screen, we get some interesting things that we have to deal with. So let's create some windows. In fact, let's just clear the desktop and go to a clean one. So let's say we're doing a bit of programming and we've got our text editor open there with some text and we decide we want to check mail. So we run our FIDONET client to go and get the mail. Uh, we need to open some files and then we decide we want to watch a video on YouTube. And so we've got lots of windows open. And as we've seen, each of these are separate programs. So there's an event loop for this program, which is handling the events coming from there. There's an event loop for this one. There's an event loop for this one. There's an event loop for our browser handling the events or the messages that are coming for that. But as well as getting the events from the user, and we can say, well, okay, this window is at the top, say, so the events will come to this one, and then we go on that one, and that one becomes on the top, and so on the events go to that one. As well as handling the events from the user, as these windows are updated, they can create events that mean that the other programs have to do things. Now, originally, obviously, a lot of the graphical user interface operating systems, Mac OS, Atari OS, Windows, um, risk costs and so on, only allowed one program to run at once, um, you still had the same thing because you had desk accessories and things which were effectively separate programs that could do these things. So for example, say I am watching the video on YouTube and I bring my text editor to the top because I want to carry on writing it while watching the video. I've now changed the position of that. It's now the current window. So I need to be told that this is now the current window so that I know where things are going because I may have more than one text editing window open, but also as I brought it to the front, I've revealed parts of the window that were previously covered up by the other windows. And so I need to ensure that those parts of the window are redrawn. Now there's various ways you can do it. Modern operating systems do lots of things to try and speed things up because they have the benefit of more memory and so they cache things. Um, and they'll often have off-screen areas where they can each draw the contents of the window and it's stored so the operating system can redraw it automatically. But originally when you did this, you would get a message from your operating system saying you need to redraw this window. And so it would tell you that you need to redraw the area here or to speed things up, it would tell you you need to redraw that bit, you need to redraw this bit and you need to redraw this bit down here. So when you got a message saying redraw the window, you wouldn't just get a rectangular area to draw. You may get several separate rectangular areas that you need to work out. Okay, I need to redraw what's in that bit and that bit and that bit. Now you could, if you were a lazy programmer, redraw everything every time you got that message and just clip to the areas. But the problem with that is that the computer would take a while to draw that. Even today, drawing lots of things, if it's a complicated thing, can still take some time to do. So what you actually try, ended up having to do is work out well, what bits are being revealed here and redraw that and so on. But you could sometimes get those things even if you weren't on top. So for example, if I'm like that and I move this window in the right way, I can end up revealing a section here and another section down here that I have to redraw. So the events come not just from the user interaction, but also from the interaction of the program with itself or with the other things. Every time you move a window, the operating system has to deal with that and tell you that you need to redraw parts of it and so on and tell you that the window's moved. So on Windows Aero, it's got see-through bits. Yeah. So who's, whose fault's that? <laughs> well, this is the thing, and this is I mean, things Mac OS X um, introduced this, Windows Aero and Windows Vista and so on. And uh, I think Wayland probably does something similar as well. I'm not so sure. Um, what they do is they say, OK, you've got lots of windows on screen um, and they're overlapping. But what we'll actually do is we'll draw all of them off screen so that they don't overlap and you might need to zoom out the other camera. And so we've got them off screen like that. And what we actually do is we say, okay, we'll draw them all so they're completely uncovered as separate blocks of memory. And then we'll make a copy of that and copy it there. And some nice visual effects going to see that copy happening. And then we'll make a copy of this and put it on the screen here. And we'll make a copy of this and put it on the screen here and a copy of that. And because we're copying pre-existing things, we can do alpha channels, we can do transparency and we can make it all look pretty and you can have wobbly windows if you've got a weird GNOME desktop. It's interesting, depending on the operating system you're using, windows can be more or less intelligent. Uh, 
generic Windows, not the operating system. Um, so, for example, on the Atari system, and I think on RISCOS, if I remember rightly, and it's been a while since the program RISCOS, um, the window basically was a container. Uh, and uh, that was it. You had a container and then you drew in it. Um, on a Mac, on Windows, Windows can actually contain other Windows and they can contain other windows, so you can sort of build things up. And so actually all the controls you get, buttons, text boxes, are actually specialized windows that you can then join together to form a hole that is a window and so on. And you can specify whether they have title bars or not, whether they have scroll bars and things. Of course, the interesting thing about redrawing things is it's simple if you have to redraw an area here because that's windows come on top of that window like that. But things get interesting if you scroll around the window. Um, you perhaps don't want to redraw everything because that will take time. I mean, when win uh, GUIs were first being invented, we had computers that probably had a, an 8 megahertz CPU that were doing these things, if that, uh, something like the Atari ST or the original Mac. These days, they're much more powerful. You're looking about sort of 500 times that speed, 4 gigahertz, sort of roughly 3, 4 gigahertz as a rough sort of speed. But even so, what we're drawing on them is now more complicated. It's sort of, it used to be a one bit window, but now we have a sort of 24 bit color with alpha channel, lots of graphics and so on it. You know, and so it's a lot more complicated what we're doing. The amount of data that needs to be created for that is much more times that. We've got high resolution displays rather than 640 by 400 and so on. So yes, the computers have got faster, but so is the amount of data and also what we're trying to draw is more complicated. Drawing a bit of text, relatively straightforward. Drawing um, a nice web page and so on becomes more complicated. And so you still have the same problems, is how do we redraw that screen quickly when we scroll through what's on there? And so you have to sort of work out what you want to do and sort of do things. And we'll have a look at that in a later one. Now I've got the token so I can load a value in, add the value from register into it, and store it back and hand the token. And now I've got the token again, I can load something into, it, into my register, add something onto it, throw it back, and pass the token on. And I've got it, so I can load the value in, add the value from my register, store it back.